from the All Indiana Podcast Network. It's time for real conversation about the real issues that affect our communities. Poverty, education, equality, and more. This is Real Talk. Real Talk with Reverend Charles Harrison. Welcome to Real Talk on the All Indiana Podcast Network. I'm Reverend Charles Harrison, and on this episode, I will be talking to Rick Snyder, uh, president of the FOP 86, about the current level of violence in the city of Indianapolis and also one of the other pressing issues in the city is that IMPD is down about 380 officers. What impact will that have on the city as we struggle to deal with surging violence? Temp check. What kind of summer are we having this year? A family road trip summer? A beach bum summer? Or a wake me up when the sun sets summer? With Instacart, choose your own adventure and skip the shopping side quests. Where available, you can get ice cream delivered to your hotel, sunscreen to the pool, or cold brew to your bed. Well, door, in as fast as 30 minutes. Wherever you find yourself this summer, you can get the goods. Download Instacart for free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Excludes restaurants. Additional terms and fees apply. They say opposites attract. That's why the Sleep Number Smart Bed is the best bed for couples. You can each choose what's right for you, whenever you like. You like a bed that feels firm, but they want soft? Sleep Number does that. You want to sleep cooler, while they like to feel warm. Sleep Number does that too. Sleep Number Smart Beds also learn how you sleep and provide you with personalized insights to help you sleep even better. You have to feel it to believe it. Find the bed that's for both of you, only at a Sleep Number store. Nine out of ten couples say they sleep better on a Sleep Number smart bed. Time to catch some Z's. J.D. Power ranks Sleep Number number one in customer satisfaction with mattresses purchased in-store. And now, during Sleep Number's biggest sale of the year, save 50% on the Sleep Number limited edition smart bed, plus special financing for a limited time. For J.D. Power 2023 award information, visit jdpower.com awards. Only at a Sleep Number store or sleepnumber.com. See store for details. Welcome to Real Talk on the All Indiana Podcast Network, and I am Reverend Charles Harrison, and good afternoon. It is a joy uh, to be with you once again, and I have a good friend and a special guest with me today, uh, Rick Snyder from the FOP, FOP 86. Uh, He is the president, and um, we go back a, a long ways <laughs> in the work that we have done. Yeah, it's, it's been a minute. We we go back a long ways, and uh, as we get ourselves set up here, they have made some changes uh, here in in the studio and have moved things around a little bit. So um, it's good to have you with us uh, with me today. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Yes, yes. Uh, if you would hit that and turn that up a little bit, so Got can you hear yourself? Yes. Okay, I hear you. Okay, all right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, because kind of an update on, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. One certainly is um, the crime and the violence uh, in the city, um, kind of where we are right now. Where, where are we right now, and um, what's kind of going on in the city? Well, unfortunately, we're still averaging a person shot or stabbed about every eight hours in the city. And then we're also averaging wow. uh, a homicide still about every 40 hours mm. in our capital city. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen is there's been a suggestion that crime and violence is actually down this year. Um, I'm not so sure about that. Okay. And okay. I think from what you and I see right, is right. It, it sometimes matters when you take the snapshot, right? Right, right. And so... Maybe there have been times where we've seen uh, some lulls throughout the year that we haven't seen in the past couple years, but then we see a significant spike again. And the trend lines we are seeing is still putting us at 200 plus homicides for the year. We cannot get down below that number uh, for whatever reasons, right? And what's frustrating in that is folks who have been around for just a minute, right, like yourself, right, like right, myself, right. Gray Beard, and everything else, <laughs> is that. Uh, we have seen times when we've been below 100 homicides in a calendar year. We know it's possible, yet for five years straight now, uh, we've seen back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back years of 200-plus homicides 
and we're still on that trend line. You know, I was in a meeting um, not long ago with uh, Chief Bailey and, um, you know, clergy leaders, community leaders, um, talking about kind of what's going on in the city. I think one of the things that was brought up in the meeting was um, it seems like, and I don't know if this is different from the past, but we seem to be having more interpersonal conflicts that tend to lead to some level of violence, whether it's a stabbing, uh, whether it's uh, a shooting takes place. But we seem to be having more of that at gas stations and other public places uh, around the city. So it doesn't seem to be concentrated in certain areas. It, oh, it, seems, to be, yeah. it seems to be all over the city now. Yeah, I was going to say we've been yeah. having interpersonal conflicts leading to violence for years. Right. But your point is, rather than being almost like a hot spot focused area, right, right. it seems to be citywide. Right. That's absolutely true. So, the, so um, you know, uh, I almost liken it to uh, the things that we've seen with gang activity, okay. which is you used to have gang activity where it was focused in geographic areas. And then over the last decade, that has gone to a decentralized uh, process right, 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 right. and coverage, basically. Much has crime and violence as well. And um, people say, well, then why is that? Well, I think a significant contributor is um, a lack of fear of any consequences, right? We know and we've right, been well right. known for saying the revolving door of criminal justice, sweetheart plea deals, little to no jail time for violent crimes and specifically repeat violent crimes is absolutely contributing to that. Right. I right, mean, right. Just, just, nobody yeah. can suggest that it's not. And so I guess the position that we have consistently taken, we being the FOP as okay. police professionals, is if you really can't debate that that is occurring and that is occurring as a result of the revolving door, what would occur if you closed the door? Okay, okay. <laughs> Especially to repeat violent offenders and actually held folks accountable for the crime and the violence that they've been convicted of, of um, committing. How would that not interrupt these cycles and more importantly these trend lines where we're seeing the 200 plus homicides any major city um you know what's the other famous uh diatribe that we hear which is well everybody's experiencing high levels of crime right, and violence right, in major right, cities right uh well one who cares that everybody else is experiencing it we don't have to right right right, right. and by by saying who cares i mean why would we just subject ourselves to we have to be the same way as everybody else we don't and we know right. you and i know right. that we've had times where we have been uh the outlier right and that that is possible but go back to the weed and seed days in mm -hmm. indianapolis on the west side right, of indianapolis right, right, yes go back to the deputy chief uh tim hortys and people right. like that right who were well known for pioneering weed and seed approaches right absolutely what was that focused on that was on weeding out right. the folks who were committing the crime and violence holding them accountable right. separating them from the neighborhood and society and then going back in and replenishing uh, uh re re um supporting the folks that are left in the neighborhood weed it then right. seed it right and we saw significant reductions right. in crime a absolutely w what is has there been conversations um, with law enforcement? For those who are listening, um, the courts, the prosecutor's office, really concerning this concern about repeat violent offenders. Has there been any serious conversations if, from law enforcement perspective, you see that as a major contributor to the surge in violence that now the city is, you know, um, approaching five consecutive years of over 200 plus homicides. Are there any conversations? Have there been any analysis done of that where um, everybody that would play a role in the helping address this issue um, sees the same thing? Uh, yeah, there have been. Actually. Okay. Okay. And uh, I think, you know, leadership matters. Right. 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 And I think a couple of things that I think have been very uh, helpful. Okay. One has been the superintendent of the state police, Doug Carter. Okay. Speaking out on the issues with the courts and the criminal justice system, criminal justice system specifically in Marion County. 
uh, he took a lot of flack for that. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah, which... Uh, <laughs> which uh, I said, welcome aboard. Right, you know? right, right. Um, but he did, and he he demonstrated leadership. He stood firm, and he talked, and he he advocated on behalf of the residents of Indianapolis, but also the police officers. And he has a bully pulpit in that role, and he okay. exercised it. Okay, he's the chief law enforcement officer in the state, right? And also oversees training for all of our officers right. in the state right. and has an obligation to those officers and all those communities of our state. And uh, so he did that. In addition, I think it was very good timing that we had the transition to Chief Bailey at the IMPD, who also has been a strong advocate, especially behind closed doors and in those types of meetings. And I get the sense that Superintendent Carter and Chief Bailey are working well together to help advocate and bring to light the issues that we are seeing in the streets with our partners. They should be our partners right. in the criminal justice system, the courts, the judges, so forth and so on. And so in those stakeholder meetings, I think things are changing. Okay. Okay. I think some efforts are being made to make some improvements. Okay. Um, but it's being done very quietly. Uh, my fear is that's solely to kind of save face or, or, um, you know, not take responsibility for past events, but help try to fix current and future events. Uh, I would say I welcome it. Okay. Like, I, you okay. Know, okay. Let's get something done and save lives here. That's got to be the focus. And so uh, we are seeing so, some uh, changes in some efforts being made to make things better. Time will tell. My fear is, is that we're not moving quick enough. Mm, so okay, okay. perhaps we could get some more momentum going. Perhaps uh, with their leadership, we can maybe get a couple more people, a couple more stakeholders at that table to really kind of help facilitate messaging as well as movement on those issues. So, um, you know, we're, we're let, let's let's kind of talk about this, because I know me and you had a, a conversation that. It was not only gun violence we were seeing an increase in, oh, but okay. also stabbings. That, stabbings yeah, have okay. surged this year. Yeah, okay. And so this is one of the things we've kind of been warning about okay. uh, to individuals on the individual level about, hey, listen, we're seeing some trends that are becoming alarming in terms of the increased use of edged weapons. Okay. So when we talk about stabbings, it's stabbings. It can be a slashing, okay, cutting, whatever the case may be. That use of edged weapons... Uh, has really spiked, and especially this year. You've seen that right, in the right, numbers. Right, right, right. We're even having some days now where we're having more stabbings than we are shootings. That's mm, right, that's different right. than what we typically have seen. And so it goes back to the question of why is that? Well, in law enforcement, one of the things that we know is that oftentimes with stabbings, they often are very violent. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, it takes a lot to be that close to somebody, right. cutting them or stabbing them, and right. then sometimes multiple times. Right. Huge anger issues that have led to the violence. And uh, and uh, I think it says a lot, again, about the heart issues that we are seeing in our society that that's occurring. And also, uh, folks that we're seeing more edged weapon use um, in, in, our, in communities of folks that are... Um, uh, housing challenged, maybe living on the streets. Okay, uh, it might be harder for them to facilitate uh, moving around with a firearm or okay. or going in and out of shelters or places such as that. So they rely more on edged weapons. We've seen uh, uh, greater use of that uh, on the streets, um, but we're also seeing it in homes and domestics and everything else. And so when we when we have folks that just make it a gun issue, right? The reason why. I, I get so frustrated with that is because we're limiting ourselves on what the true issues are at hand. Right. Okay. We're blaming an object versus the heart of the people that are involved. And the reason why we keep talking about this is that if we can work on changing the hearts of the folks involved, right, we right. can prevent the violence. Right, right, right. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes we get bogged down where people get so focused on an agenda versus actions with people. And, and, care, and compassion right. about the people involved, uh, that it's short-sighted and more people die. Well, I, I think part of it is they, they're trying to simplify a very complex issue, and <laughs> they want to remove the heart issue and say, hey, if we just get rid of the guns, the violence is going to go down. 
and and we're seeing you know an increase in stabbing. So if you if you did get get all ri- get rid of all the guns, uh, uh, violence crimes are not going to cease. You know, yeah, you and didn't do anything you to did, address that. Yeah, you didn't do anything to to address that. Are we seeing? It, it seems like we're seeing a lot more violence uh, the last few years uh, among women. You know, yes, we're sir. we're seeing that. You know where. Uh, it seems like more women are are the victims of violence, and, and possibly they may be the s- uh, suspects of it too. Women and juveniles. Okay, ju- women greater and juveniles. Greater victimization. Okay. Uh, greater criminal activity. So, so is, is, is why? What's going on with that? What? Well, I think we're reaping what has been sown. Okay. Right. Okay. We have had many years where we, where I say we, we as a society, society. we as, as a community, right, have sown. Um, no accountability, no, quite frankly, in a lot of ways, no shame for okay. crimes being committed. Right. Right. Um, n- no sense of remorse. Um, and that has continued to flourish in communities where you see less fear of consequences, greater victimization. And then in turn, that breeds a cycle of violence that then even the victims become the suspects in future criminal acts. And um, that is why it's so important. I'll give you the example. Take domestic violence, for example. Right, right. What do we know now mm-hmm. when children are witnesses to violence in the home? The odds go up dramatically that they will become perpetrator or victims of the same kind of violence mm. later in life. Right, right, right. That is true. That right? is true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, there. There are definitely ways to interrupt. That's why oftentimes you'll hear me say intervention is prevention. Right, right, right. I would much rather intervene, even if that means an arrest and having to take somebody to jail on a lower level offense and get intervention by the courts to get involved to interrupt the cycle, right? Throw people off the path of destruction that they're on versus doing nothing, turning a blind eye, shrugging our shoulders, cycling them right back out into the neighborhoods with no intervention, and then watching that um, dramatically increase in volatility and violence and then lose another resident or visitor to the city. Why, why has there been a reluctance to do that? I, I, I know those who, who feel like the judicial system has, uh, you know, disproportionately impacted com- communities of color but if you are um, doing things uh, once they have been arrested to intervene so that they don't commit the same crime why isn't some of uh, um, the funding that's been available out there directed toward that you know uh, well, I mean you know Somebody's got to be the unpopular one to say it. Okay. Our, our criminal justice system has been hijacked okay. by other agendas. Okay. Agendas that have been uh, that have been so-called reforms that okay. have done nothing but serve to deform the system. And you've heard me say it before, it, it, with an attempt to break it and then remake it. And people say, "Well, why do folks want to remake the system?" Right. right. Well, you'll have the you'll have the folks that say. Um, because the system was flawed to begin with, and we're trying to fix it and make it better, more fair, all of those things. And I think there's a lot of good-hearted people, well-intentioned, uh, that uh, really participate in some of those endeavors. But by far, we have seen consistently there's a lot more folks that have other agendas at play. And quite frankly, Rev, a lot of it comes down to a whole lot of money flowing around for this program, that program, this new approach, whatever the case may be. And you can't continue with those programs if you don't have continued cycles of violence. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, let but, me just give you one example. Okay, go give me an example. We look at yeah. the city of Indianapolis. Right, right, right. And we're spending $4.5 million okay. on so-called violence interrupters. Okay, okay. What interruption of violence is occurring? Because we're not seeing it. Okay. Okay. Right? Right. Uh, you've heard me say, uh, right. who are these violence right. interrupters? Right. Right. Like, who are they? <laughs> right. Uh, we're paying people on average $55,000 a year and have no idea who they even are. How does that work? So so is there much interaction with that program and, and, and 
INPD, the districts, you know, what's what's happening in the community. If you don't know them, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, let, there's, let me there's suggest troubling. this to you. Okay. Because we've seen right. where, how it can work. Right. You and I have done it. Right. That's true. In real life, on the streets of Indianapolis, in the thick of it. Right. Standing shoulder to shoulder. Right. You know. Right. Um, me in uniform, you there as right. part of the faith community right. and a city leader and a right. trusted voice, standing together in unity saying, this isn't going to be tolerated in this neighborhood, right? right? That's true. And uh, uh, we saw it work. What I can tell you is our street-level officers today, they aren't interacting with these folks. They okay. don't. They tell me, I don't, I don't know who they are. Okay. Well, how's okay. that? I'm going to ask you, how would that work? It would be difficult to work. How would you get that to work yeah, if yeah. we had approached it right, that way? Right. I, how yeah. would that have ever worked? Yeah, and, and I think part of it is there is this you know, uh, viewpoint out there, particularly, and we see it in other cities too, that uh, groups like, for instance, 10 Point should not be working with law enforcement. Well, that goes against the whole approach that we used in Indianapolis with Weed and Seed. It was basically a collaborative partnership. That's what I was going <laughs> yes, to say. Yes, how, yes. Do you, how do you have success if you don't have collaboration? Yeah, yeah. This to me is like, the prosecutor in Marion County who says, I'm not partners with law enforcement. Right. We're right. not on the same team. Has said that publicly mm. before. Right. Well, then how is that supposed to work? Right. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. Right. 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 Now, in more recent times, there's been more public statements that uh, where he has said they are our partners. OK. Well, which okay. is it? OK. Apparently be, not being partners didn't work very well. Right. Right. So. You've got to have collaboration. And it's not just between f- folks within the profession or within the system. Right. It's folks in the neighborhoods. Right. In the homes. I right. always say this. It's the residents in the neighborhoods and the police officers. Right. They're the only two that are in the neighborhoods 24 hours a day. That's true. They're the true. only ones. You That's know true. this. That's true. Because I always say this. Let's just you, use you and I as an right. example right. again. Pick any one of the projects that we did up north. Right. Um. When we were standing in the middle of 30th and College, let's right. say. Yeah. Mapleton Fall Creek. We Mapleton worked Fall yes, Creek. We yes. worked there. Right. When we were standing there, uh, do you remember the judge that was standing out there with us? No. Yeah, neither do I. Yeah. You yeah. remember yeah. You remember the uh, councilman that was standing out there with us? No. No, I don't remember that either. What about the social worker or the public defender or the prosecutor? You remember any of them? No. I, I don't remember any of that right, either. Right, right, right. So... But we were there. Right. The residents were there. Right. And that is my point. Okay. Is that you have to get people around the table pulling in the same direction. Right. I welcome uh, questions. I welcome challenges to our thought process. Diversity of thought at the table, various backgrounds, experiences, and exposures, I place a value on. Right. But it's all got to be done with the purpose of pulling in the same direction toward the same objective here. You, you, Not against one another. Yeah, what what I do remember back in the day, it would be these meetings that we would mm-hmm. have with um, probation judges uh, or someone from the judge's the office, courts. Yep. the courts, um, you know, uh, the prosecutor's office, uh, the U.S. attorney's office, um, INPD at that time, the sheriff's office, the FBI, DEA. And community leaders. So it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> and, and and we would discuss what was happening in the neighborhood, where it was happening at, and what was going to be the strategy to address it, to That's get right. everybody on the same page. And, and sometimes they need a community buy-in to go out and weed things out. <laughs> you, you remember yes, yes. when we would do those projects. Right. So at that time... Um, I was a lieutenant, had multiple units that we could leverage together to right. go out and work in the neighborhood, right. right? Do you remember, you know, some people would say, well, all those guys want to do is go out and lock everybody up. Do right. you remember I would give one metric that would judge the success or failure of our efforts? Do right. you remember this? I would say I don't care. I'm not I'm not focused on how many arrests are getting made, how right. many vehicles, traffic stops are occurring, right. all those other things. What we pointed out was we will judge our success or, or failure 
on when we see kids playing in their yards again. Right. You remember this? Right, I remember that. We were yeah. in Mapleton Fall Creek area, and right. I took our officers out there and said, take a good look around. What right. don't you see and what don't you hear? Right. We're in the middle of summer, and we don't see or hear kids playing. Right. The playground over there is empty. You know, if if you do see any children, they're, they're uh, remanded up onto the porch of the house and can't even go into their yard. Right. Well, that that can't be happening. Right. And so that's how we judged our success. Now, we used various means to get there. Right. If it meant arrest and removing the known criminal elements that were uh, really infecting and terrorizing that neighborhood, we would get them removed. But then we would also be out there the next day with a vacuum truck clearing out the sewer lines right. so that the street wouldn't flood. Right. And we bring life back into that Right. That dead end of the street that was, right. you remember right. that? Right. Yes. Replace yes. street lights, right. enhance right. lighting, all right. those other things. Crime prevention through environmental design, right. huge advocate That's of that. That's true. That's true. Um, in, in improving the quality of life in the neighborhood. That was the focus. That right. was the objective. Right. And uh, we got a lot of major things done by everybody pulling in the same direction. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, still today. Uh, Mapleton Fall Creek is not the neighborhood that it was as far as the level of violence that we were seeing in the late 90s, early 2000s. You know, it's just it's just not the work that was done back then, yeah. you know, made the neighborhood, you know, a lot safer, nicer um, than what it was pri- prior to that. One, one of the other things that that in our conversation we had that 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 I've been paying attention to um and because I'm out too, there are things that I hear and see. Sure, it is it is uh, whether we call it the shortage of police officers. I think you mm-hmm. tweeted something. Uh, what are you three hundred fifty, three hundred eighty uh, officers down? Uh, I've got the latest numbers. You have the latest numbers. So yes. let me give you the context. Okay. Here. So okay. we the IMPD has been funded. At a level of 1,743 officers. Okay. Okay? Now, we're not at that. All right. But the funding is there for that. Okay. Thank God. Right. Because even with the shortage, right. that available funding has allowed us the opportunity to hire officers back to okay. help cover those vacancies. Right. right? And you got to remember, when we're talking about vacancies, that means an officer that's not in that beat in those neighborhoods serving that day. Right. So I always ask people... Uh, what day of the week do you want your neighborhoods to not have any police presence in it? Mm, mm. <laughs> Most people say, mm, I don't want to be in that line, right, right? Right, Last year, really about October of 2023, right before the election, uh, the mayor came out and said, I'm adding 100 officers to that total okay. because we need them in this city. Right. I don't know if you remember that, right. but uh-huh. he's very adamant, and that was a— really a, a campaign a campaign pledge that he made as okay, well okay that raised the number to 1843 mm. right now here's the thing people say well that must is that some kind of pie in the sky dream number of right. what we want to get to no that's what everybody has agreed are the bare basic minimum numbers we need to the, do the bare minimum service levels that are expected. So that is the minimum number. That minimum. You, wow, wow. Rick Height, you'll right, remember right, him, right. chief here in Indianapolis, right. he was well known f- for saying, I have 1,500 officers doing the work of 3,000. Wow. He was right about that. Now people say, are you saying we should have 3,000 officers? No, but I think most anyone who does the job, works in the, in the, in the neighborhoods and sees the, the volume of, of calls right and the level of service expectations that are there most would agree the real number we should probably be at that would be a satisfactory service level number would probably be closer to probably 2000 to 2200 officers mm. we're saying 1843 bare minimum level okay okay as of this week we are at uh, we are 398 officers short of wow. that. Wow. So we're at wow. 1,445 officers. Wow, wow. Think about wow. that. No, I, I am thinking so about that. So people say, well, yeah. 398 officers, what's that mean? Well, th- let me give you some context and some perspective. That would be saying if we took basically took the entire investigations right. division of IMPD right. away, right? that's how short we are. Wow. So then I always ask people, flip that around. What could we do? What kind of results would we see if we had 
double the number of detectives in our investigation right, division. Right, right, right. If Deputy Chief Kendall Adams right. had 400 more detectives working right. for him, right. what kind of outcomes could he achieve? Right. And I know he would welcome them. It's also the equivalent of saying, if today we went and took Northwest District, Southwest District, and Southeast District off of the map, all those officers, that's how short we are. Mm. Mm. Now, that gives you some perspective. Right, we have right. six districts in this city. <laughs> right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Those are huge numbers, and that gives you a feel for how low of a level of staffing we're operating with. That also means that our officers are out there with that much less backup, that much less support, that much less resources to investigate crimes, provide assistance, provide service, help engage in the schools in our community, help engage during summer programs like the great program and things like that that are gang resistance um, in our city. That's a big deal. And what I keep saying, and I think Chief, I can't speak for Chief Bailey, but I, I don't get the sense that he disagrees, which is this, is that we can't keep asking our officers to do more with less. Okay. And we are either going to get to where we need to be to provide the service levels that our community right, expects. Right. Or what do we do? We don't, there isn't a plan B. I always say that there right. isn't a B team, right? There's not the A team IMPD. And then if that doesn't work, we go and, and pull from the bench of IMPD to get more. There is none. So, what do you what do you do in that circumstance? And so that's why we've been so adamant that we have got to address this officer shortage. So people say, well, then you're saying we need to recruit more officers. Well, yes, we do. But right. the problem is, is that we're in a point in place in our society where there's been so much um, uh, vitriol directed at our officers that people look at that and say, I don't want to do that. On top of an officer is dying in the line of duty in this nation every 52 hours. That's not really good odds for the job to go into. If I said to you, Reverend, uh, pastors are dying once every 52 hours right, doing right, their job, right, being killed right, or right, whatever right, the case may be. Right. It, it would, would impact you? the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> it would impact the numbers. Right? Yes. Yes. And yes. so you kind of have the perfect storm where it's very difficult to get people into the door. Okay. Our, our current academy class, we should have gotten, we needed to get about right. 80 officers, 80 recruits into that class. As of this week, we have seven. Wow. Seven. Wow. So that means that we as an agency, we have to flip the script. We have to change our approach. Instead of putting all of our eggs in the basket of trying to recruit officers in, we need to keep doing that. Right. But we have got to place a focus on retaining the officers we have. Okay. Okay. So right now, on average, four out of every 10 IMPD officers are eligible to retire and walk out the door. Hmm. Mm. What's that mean? It means we better focus on keeping a higher level of morale amongst the rank and file or they can just leave. So is this the result, you know, real conversation of what happened with the George Floyd riots across the country and the Black Lives Matter movement, the defund the police movement? Did that change the landscape across this country when it came to Americans view of police officers, um, uh, particularly more so in larger urban cities. Uh, What this is a result of is uh, the the point in time, which really started around 2020. All right. Of demonizing, dehumanizing and demoralizing the police. Okay. Okay. Right. At the same time. An influx in attacks on law enforcement. Right. We have seen some of the highest levels of violence directed towards officers that we have seen in decades. Wow. Sometimes, if ever. Wow. Uh, record levels of officers being shot, stabbed, ran over by cars, violently attacked, and record surges in ambush attacks on our officers. Mm. And remember, it's not just guns. Right. We just had a conviction of a guy who was arrested for stabbing two of our officers Mm. on a run. You'll remember that. Right, right, right. 
But it's the perfect storm of dehumanizing, demoralizing, demeaning the police, demonizing the police, and at the same time, the revolving door of criminal justice, okay. which is letting violent offenders out quicker than the officers can put them in. So if you arrest somebody, separate them, interrupt the cycles of violence, but they're coming right back into the neighborhood before you can even finish the report, we've got problems. It's come from so-called bell reform efforts that have occurred right, in this right, nation, right, 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 for repeat violent offenders. Right. And so we have just really opened the floodgates of, of bringing in every different way that you can destabilize law and order, public safety, and communities and then said, why can't we get people to do these jobs? Why are officers leaving? Well, they're leaving communities where they don't feel supported, where they have low levels of morale, and where we have eviscerated the rank and files of those police departments. They're either leaving to go to other police agencies and communities where they support them, or they're leaving the profession altogether. Either way, it's the residents of the community who suffer. Right, right. And what, right. one of the things that I talk about you know, um, you you brought up an or an, organiz, or an an organization, but I always say this: we have different groups telling us what lives matter. Right. But we're the ones saying that the 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 people who are impacted by violence the most in the city of Indianapolis, right, is disproportionately our fellow black neighbors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if that's the case, right, um, we need to get a handle on that. We're talking 75 to 80 percent victimization rates and right. homicides, right. criminal homicides right. as right. well right. in this city of Indianapolis. Yet our, our, our fellow black neighbors are only representing about 28 to 30 percent of the population. So that means they're two, two and a half times overly represented in terms of victimization of homicide. And if that's the case, their victimization of violence like that. And then we remove the people that are helping to protect and serve them. Who's going to suffer the most? Well, one of my concerns, and if if you're down in the district and you have a major event, you have a shooting. Critical incident. Crit, yeah, you have a shooting, critical incident, and you're pulling all of those officers in that district to that scene. Yes, sir. Who's left in the district to patrol the rest of the area? Y'all have pretty large districts. We do. Let me give you some okay, perspective right, on that. Okay. Uh, if folks are, you know, from Indianapolis, they'll right. understand this, even the state of Indiana. The city of Indianapolis, in the city of Indianapolis, we have six service districts. Okay. One of those service districts is North District. Right. I used to work there. That's we used where to I live. Together, I live right? there. Yes. North District. A okay. lot of people don't realize this. North District, if it was a city unto itself, okay. it would be the second largest city in the state of Indiana. Wow. Think wow. about that. Yeah. Just that one district. Yeah. That one district is larger than Fort Wayne. Wow. I was going to say that. It's larger than Fort It is. You see what I'm saying? It's a large district. (laughs) Now, this is what I always say. Now, take the number of officers working in that district and compare it to Fort Wayne. It's significantly lower than the number of officers they have there. But yet they, unto themselves, would be the second largest city in the state of Indiana. Wow. Wow. You see what I mean? I see what you're saying. And so to your point... When you have a critical incident that occurs, Southeast District is over 80 square miles. Hmm. Like the city of Baltimore, I think, is what, 60 square miles? Right, right. Southeast District by itself is 80 square miles. Wow. And so you have a critical incident that occurs, let's say, in Fountain Square that pulls all these resources in from the district. To your point, you're living in Franklin Township. Right. Guess what? Right. There is no police coverage out there. Right. During that time. Right. But- You expect there to be. You expect that if somebody's breaking into your back door in the middle of the night and you call 911, that there's an officer close that's going to get to you. But if you say, no, they're having to come from Fountain Square or they're having to come from another district. Another district, yes. How how does that make you feel? So who should be having these conversations that that, that, um, we have this shortage? Um, I have heard sometimes on the radio where there are no more officers available. You've heard this on the police radio. I heard on the police radio. No more like officers available. The scanner. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I've heard that. Um, you know, for those who don't know, I'm state police chaplain too. You've heard what? I, I, You've heard what was being said? I've heard where calls have come in and the dispatcher says we have no officers available. Oh. That does happen. Yeah. And so you have to look at... Now, this is the other thing. So the 
you know, uh, leaders in leadership position, they have to they have to try to ass- assuage those concerns, right? So right. they may say, well, listen, we've got many other officers working in other parts of the city. So if push comes to shove, we can pull officers from another district to get there. Well, but how long does it take? What, what, will, what will it take? How long does it take yes, yes, to if get you across pull, the city? Yes. If, I mean, how long yes. does it take just to get across one district? Yes. Let alone the city. But here's yes. the other point okay. that everybody forgets. Okay. Okay. So... Now I'm pulling all these people to Fountain Square. Let's right, use our example. Right. I've got this burglary in progress in Franklin Township, right? Right. So I say, no worries. I'm going to just have send officers from East District down to them. Now, it's going to take longer to get to them. Right. It might take 12, 15 minutes. Right. 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 But we're going to pull them and go down there. Well, here's my question to you. So who's covering their area in East District while they're doing that? That's right. You see what I'm saying? So it becomes saying. this vicious right. circle. Right. Right. That, again, shortchanges the level of service that the residents of the community are expecting and also paying for. Right. That's, right. that's what I always say. Right. Don't forget, right. those right. are taxpayers that are paying for that level of service. That's why I do not support this thought process of, hey, we've got limited resources, so we're going to put more officers in areas with uh, a higher volume of calls, higher volumes of crime, all these other things. And then these other areas that don't traditionally have those higher levels of call, we're going to keep those thinly staffed, mm, right? Well, mm. you're managing resources. I understand right, that. Right, right. But that's still not fair to the to the resident that's in that other area. They expect the same level of police service and protection that other parts of the city are getting. Right, right, right. So, right. But we cannot do that if we don't have the resources being the number of officers to be able to spread them evenly out across the city. So what does that mean? Well, then that means we have to be very selective and proactive in how we are doing our policing. But it also means this. You start greatly reducing the ability to provide su- additional services now you've got to prioritize what services you're Mm -hmm, going to provide mm -hmm. now you start becoming a purely reactive police department Mm -hmm. rather than a proactive police department Mm -hmm. under this model right now that we're operating in you and i could not have done the work that we did some years ago right right because we would have been so short staffed that i would have to use those officers to be out taking run after run after run right versus being freed up to do project oriented policing in that neighborhood so who would have suffered that neighborhood Right. Right. There would have been greater victimization, greater levels of crime. That's why we see crime continuing to stay at these high levels, these trends of over 200 plus homicides, plus everything else. And at the same time, the number of officers going down consistently. That's why not long ago we put up a billboard in downtown Indianapolis, most viewed billboard in the city. Right. (laughs) Yeah. 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 They had a simple message, but it's absolutely correct. We can't help if we're not there. Wow. 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 It's the example I gave you in Franklin Township. Right, we right. can't help that resident with the burglary right. if we're not there or wherever else it is in the city. You know, and, and we've seen that. North District's a great example. That's one where you see officers getting pulled all the time. Something major happened in the Castleton area. Now, um, you know, all around uh, Mapleton Fall Creek, 38th Street Corridor, yes, yes, Broad yes. Ripple Bro- Broad gets Ripple. left short. Right, right, right. That that that's true. That's true, and we we have we have seen that. And 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 recently, I, I think part of my concern is the problems we have in downtown on Saturday night. You got four or five hundred kids. Y'all having to pull a lot of officers sometime to deal with that. Where are they coming from? That's right. Yeah. Because they're not coming from the bench. Yes, yes. There's not a closet that we go and break them out (laughs) in case of an emergency. Right, right, (laughs) right. We're we're choosing not to cover something else to provide that officer for that need. Right, right. That's where we're at. You know, that's, that's, you know, we don't have much time left, but that's one of the things that really concerns me. Well, let me give you some positives. Okay, go go, give me some positives. We've all been negative this whole time. Here are some positives (laughs) we have going in the right direction. We still have a workforce that comes to work every day, women and men that come to work every day, still wanting to serve this community, protect this community, and even risk their lives in doing that. For all the challenges they face. Right, right. All the grief they take oftentimes, okay, okay. they faithfully suit up and show up the very next day and go back and do it again. They are remarkable human beings, and we are beyond blessed and often take it for granted. But we're surrounded by women and men like that that are willing to stand the line as thin as it is okay. to help protect our communities. At the same time, 
We have a chief of police that the good news is, is that we have seen him in action. He yes. gets what we are talking about. Right, right. He's done it. He's right. done it on North District right. as a commander. Yes, yes, yes. He's done it on Southeast District as a commander, and he's done it for many years in executive staff. So I know he gets the value of what we're talking about. Right. His challenge is how does he get the resources to get back to that? Right. That's where we come in. Okay. Helping with that, working with our council, working with the mayor's office. You know, for as many times as the mayor and I butt heads in public, right, right. I do truly believe we have the same objective, which is the safety of our com- community and improving the quality of life in this city, our capital city right, of the state of right, Indiana. Right, right. Sometimes we differ on how we get there, but one thing you can say is that he has worked diligently to, again, raise right. the staffing that right. we need, even if we're not getting there yet, getting the funding for that in conjunction with our council. Uh, he's got... The, probably what's frustrating for him is he's got a lot more work to do moving forward because we're on the edge of this cliff. How do we compete and keep the officers that we have? Uh, people don't realize it, but our officers are going to surrounding communities in droves. There's in Plainfield, Indiana, okay, mm-hmm. just to the west of us, there is the equivalent of an entire shift of officers that are all former IMPD officers Wow! that left wow. here and went there. Wow. We just had two more officers that left, one with 16 years of experience and one with like three or five years of experience. You just don't recoup that. Mm. And when you have people with 16 years of longevity up and leaving an organization, um, you got to look into why is that occurring? Right. Because right. there's there should be every reason for them to stay. And that's not just experience, but a huge investment of taxpayer dollars into their training and um, just a lot of knowledge that we're losing. So we have a brain drain that's occurring, an experience drain. But again, the good news is I think we've got folks in leadership positions that are wanting to get to the same objective. I think if we can work together and get around a table, I think we can get there and start pushing these numbers down. I really believe that. I think for the first time in many years, things have lined up but we've got to fix this this internal battle first, which is the staffing. If we can fix that first, at the same time make start making these slow changes in the criminal justice system, I think we finally start seeing some momentum, and then other people jumping in and helping get us there. Is this unrealistic, uh, a more regional approach to policing the metropolitan Indianapolis area, in, in, in the sense that police departments are... Um, normally limited by the city lines. I see what you're saying. See what I'm saying? So one that's another thing that's actually moving in the right direction. Okay. We have a great regional cooperation approach. Okay. One of the areas that we've done that here again, to right. Chief Bailey's credit, right. is he has really led the way on Crime Gun Intelligence Center. Okay. Which is a collaborative approach. Collaboration. Okay. Collaborative approach amongst law enforcement agencies across geographical boundaries. Okay. So we have Uh, teams that are working together. We have officers from Fishers working with officers of IMPD and so forth and so on, tackling and focusing on issues involving guns used in crime. Right. But again, they're not focusing on the gun. That's just the means to get to the offender behind the gun, the trigger puller. Right. To get them off of the street. Right. And then at the same time, because we've got that regional approach, we've got some court systems that are working together on that front as well that's a game changer the other thing is it's not just crime and violence it's also issues like fentanyl that has completely flooded in and overtaken communities last year and the year before we had over 800 overdose deaths in the city of indianapolis in one year right over 80 percent of those were fentanyl related we now have uh, a law that we Mm -hmm. helped get passed Mm -hmm. that actually enhances the criminal penalties for anyone who Uh, deals in those narcotics uh, that result in death with enhanced penalties. At the same time, we've got a regional approach to because drug dealers, criminal offenders, they don't respect boundaries. Right, right. Absolutely. (laughs) And they don't respect geographical boundaries. And so now, rather than working in silos, to your point, we're working with this um, uh, interwoven system that's overlaying the geographic region of central Indiana, and I think we can see some real good progress, and that really ultimately is under the umbrella 
of a lot of good, solid leadership from superintendents of the state police, Doug Carter. Well, qu- question, one, one last question. If there was, say for instance, there was an incident in the East District that pulled everyone away from the 38th and Post Road area, just about. Everybody was gone. You had an incident at 38th and Post, and a call comes in, 911, someone shot. Could a Lawrence unit that may be a minute away, could they respond to that? Absolutely. So we have okay. mutual aid agreements okay. is what we call okay. them. The, okay. So let's say we had that scenario. Right, right. We would immediately uh, request assistance from Lawrence Police Department okay. and the Cumberland Police Department to come okay. up and assist. Okay. Same thing goes those agencies. They also have mutual aid agreements where they can cross over or have others cross back into them. Okay. From Hamilton County and in uh, Hancock County, okay. okay, where we cross geographical lines, right? We have that on Southeast District, like that scenario with Franklin Township. Right. Perhaps we ask for assistance from Southport Police Department, right, and the Johnson County Sheriff's Department, okay. if need be. Okay, so we do have those in place, but at some point in time, you run into the same thing. When I'm pulling those officers from those other communities, what's happening there? So you pick and choose. You really use that as kind of a last resort, but okay. it's available to us. Okay, why don't we? get ahead of it and staff it appropriately here with the tax dollars from the taxpayers who are expecting that level of service and protection. Oh, the That's state, what we need to do. Uh, is the state police short? I used to I used to ride every week um, as a state police chaplain um, and the, the trooper I rode with basically covered the east side of Indianapolis. Yeah. Um, after rush hour, we would go down into the neighborhoods. Yeah. Is, is a lot of that still going on? Uh, they're trying to do that. Okay. Now, one of the things for the okay. state police that's been a blessing is they actually have gotten ahead of the curve on competing for officers. Right. So the things that we need to be doing, they've already gone yeah. down the road of. Okay. You would know probably they just did a significant right. pay raise for their troopers. Right. Yes. They were historically underpaid, but right. now they're the top paid agency right. in the state of Indiana. Okay. Guess what? Right. <laughs> people want to go and work right, there. Right. 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 So, you know, some people say, well, then it's all about money. That's not what I'm saying. Right. What right. I'm saying, though, is you've got to incentivize people to do these jobs. And it is economics from this point. The demand and the need for officers is far outpacing the supply that we have. Mm -hmm. So the cost of doing business is going to go up, but also um, the need and the need to compete is going to increase as well. Rick, thank you. This this has been a, a great conversation. I hope it helps. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it's been a great conversation, and I, and I hope everybody that's going to be listening um, to this was uh, well-informed. Uh, as I was, because some of the things I did not know, I have sure. some ideas <laughs> sure. about what we can do, but but I think this was very informative. So thank you so much. Can for, I say one last yeah, thing? Yeah, go ahead. Don't give up on our officers. Okay. Pray for our police. Amen. And pray for our community. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this has been Reverend Harrison on, on Real Talk. Um, And I try to bring you real talk about real issues that affect our community here in Indianapolis and across the country. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast. And also, I am now going live on uh, X, used to be Twitter. Uh, This will also be on Facebook and YouTube from the All Indiana Podcast Network. Thank you so much for joining me. And I pray that you have a blessed day an awesome day. This is Real Talk with Reverend Charles Harrison. Be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast. And be sure to check out other great podcasts on the All Indiana Podcast Network. Online now at allindianapodcast.com.